Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Post curator Kevin Adkison with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today I am broadcasting from uh, the home of Henry Scripps Booth and Carolyn Farr Booth, uh, the youngest son of George and Ellen Scripps Booth, Cranbrook's founder. Uh, you may remember that a few months ago during the summer we did a tour of Thornley you want to learn all about Thornley and the family history of who built this house and some of the beautiful objects inside, I encourage you after today's Facebook Live at Five tour to scroll back through the uh, Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research pages video tab and you can find the Thornley House tour. Today is going to be a little bit different. I am going to take us through the whole house again but only looking at the Powabic pottery tile installations. So Powabic pottery was founded in 1903 by Mary Chase Perry Stratton uh, in downtown Detroit at the Revelation Kilns with her business partner Horace Calkins. And Powabic pottery became known as one of the uh, country's foremost handcrafted arts and crafts movement uh, potteries. And part of Mary Stratton's uh, passion was never doing commercial con commissions. So she never made tiles uh, for sort of serial reproduction. About the biggest projects that Powabic ever took on in Stratton's lifetime uh, were projects like Kingswood School for Girls, where she was actually quite conflicted about the 120 some odd bathrooms that she created tiles for. And was that commercial production or was it still handicraft. Here at Thornley there was no such debate because each of these bathrooms is totally unique and she also created fireplaces in the home as well as window sills, radiator covers, and even some flooring. So today's tour will take us through and examine some of the Powabic pottery installations. Um, why Powabic today on this kind of dreary but more November uh, day here in Michigan. Well, on Sunday I will be leading a tour of Mary Stratton's own house. Uh, her house was designed by the architect uh, William Buck Stratton, who was vice president of the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts when George Booth was president. He was also friends with Mary Chase Perry and together uh, they designed her a house in the city of Detroit. Eventually they would marry and they would move the house from Detroit to Gross Point Farms, brick, brick by brick and beam by beam and all of her tiles. So on Sunday, I'm going to be doing an in-depth tour of that house. You can buy tickets at center.cranbrook.edu. It is going to be a really amazing tour. It is a very special home and it is uh, still occupied as a private residence. And so this is a really behind the scenes treat that the center is offering you. So make sure after today's live tour, you head over to our website and get your tickets to that Powabic Pottery House tour. Today though, we will focus on Henry and Carolyn and their house Thornley. Just to give you a sense of where we are, uh, Brookside is right behind those trees, the early childhood center, the Hedgegate Apartments there. This is the sort of um, Italian Florentine gate that borders the property that you can see from Cranbrook Road. Or Cranbrook Road. Now Cranbrook House is just behind those trees there, the sunken garden. And then we have Thornley, which faces, looks over the, the southern edge of the Japanese garden. Now the architect of Thornley was Henry Booth himself. He studied architecture at the University of Michigan, and this was one of his very first and largest projects. He designed the house in 1925. Aliel Saarinen, George Booth, they were all at the laying of the cornerstone in 1925. The family moved in in 1926, and they lived here until Carolyn and Henry's passing in the 1980s. This is where they raised five children, uh, and then uh, those children generously gave the house to Cranbrook in the late 1980s. 
It is a mix of styles from sort of um, uh, French influence, Dutch influence, English influences, Italian influences into a really wonderful sort of American eclecticism. Uh, the brick is Dutch brick shipped here from the Netherlands to, through New York Harbor. Uh, the concrete block is made locally uh, and then a ceramic roof. But right as we look into the front door, uh, you see our first Powabic pottery installation. Uh, and so the floor of the vestibule and coat room are all Powabic tiles. And we see the uh, really great handmade quality of Powabic that, it's, that uh, Mary was known for with this sort of uh, texture that you can only get by individually hand molding each tile and then hand firing them. And the glaze is really uh, quite spectacular. Now we look through the gate, which was designed by Henry Booth and Walter Nichols, Cranbrook's great blacksmith. And then more of the Poabic pottery extends into the coat room. We come in and we see uh, Melinda B Booth there, and then all of the wonderful paintings and furnishings are things that I have discussed on the main Thornley tour. So do scroll back and watch that if you want to learn more about objects like the Duri Shri, which is a good luck goddess from the South Pacific who is swinging above us. But we come across our very first Powabic installation along the walls. And this is a radiator cover. And so it has these wonderful pierced tiles and you're starting to see how some of them uh, pick up and reflect the light. These glazes are what Mary Stratton was known for. And so though she was interested in form and the shape of her vessels and sort of the aesthetics of her pottery, she was equally interested in the glazes and what chemical she could use to create different effects on the pottery. Now, there are a number of these radiator covers, and so I'm going to step into the main living room and say hello to the man of the house, Henry, painted here, and the lady of the house, Carolyn, at the other end. And of course, they in loved music and uh, they were friends with many important jazz musicians and classical musicians. And so they had their Steinway here right in the front window. And then on the other side of the room, we see more Powabic window sills and Powabic tiles or uh, radiator covers again. Now, Powabic, the word itself, is a Chippewa word of Wabic, which means metal, or Biwabic, which is iron or steel. And it was the name of an Upper Peninsula coal mine in Hancock, Michigan, which is where Mary Stratton is from. And at first she simply called her pottery the Revelation Kiln because that was the name of the type of kiln that her partner, Horace Coggins, was selling. Uh, but they realized as they were going into a gift mart in Chicago that they needed to have a better, a stronger brand. And so Mary Stratton made a list of words that she thought would be a nice name for a pottery. And one of those, she looked back in her memory of her childhood in Hancock, Michigan, and she took this uh, adaptation of a Chippewa word, Bowabic, and turned it into Powabic. And so the name uh, has been in use since the early 1900s. And so you can find her pottery all the way up through today because Powabic is still down on Jefferson Avenue making ceramics. Uh, they moved into the building there on Jefferson Avenue in 1907, expanded it in 1912, and then expanded it again in 2019. Now, one of the beautiful things about having handmade tile in your house is that you can uh, really each element is custom made and so you have these beautiful corners and for all of the riches of Cranbrook archives we don't have a ton of contact between Mary Stratton and Henry Booth but we do have one letter from 1927 where Mary thanks Henry and Carolyn uh, for all of their work here in the house and she also says that it was great 
fun to work with Henry and Carolyn and that she appreciated them as clients because they understood the plasticity of the medium. They understood uh, sort of what was the natural quality of clay that made it so beautiful in an architectural setting. And they didn't try to have her tiles do things they didn't want to do or force her designs to um, fit within a scheme, but instead collaborated with her on beautifying the home. Now, there's no Puavic in the dining room, but here we see the family dining room with the uh, breakfast nook at the end. And then we'll head down to the courtroom where there is a really remarkable window ledge of Puavic. Now, I'll talk a lot more on Sunday's uh, tour about the history of Mary Stratton and how Puabic developed, but one of the most important parts of her uh, enterprise were the glazes. And so she spent almost 10 years studying chemistry of glazes uh, and working on getting these iridescent or metallic finishes. Um, she had a really rough time. She could get a beautiful effect, but then what exactly caused that effect? And you have to isolate the different chemicals that you put on into the glaze and the different clay bodies and mineral compounds. And all of that can change and all of that can affect the outcome. And so eventually she was able to get this sort of dependability of production without industrial controls. Uh, and so though she did not have a factory and she didn't have a catalog, she does sort of develop a singular aesthetic, which used low heat, vaporized kerosene, and lead-based glazes. It was a, a formula she had perfected by about 1909, and which we are seeing here in these tiles from about 1926, which are based on the tiles that she created for the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. And so that great church in Washington was based on uh, Spanish Byzantine architecture and the sort of um, uh, Romanesque architectural design. Mary Stratton and her husband Buck traveled to Spain and to Italy to study these designs in the original forms. And then she developed sort of her own language of geometry, botanic life. Here we have a peacock with the luster glaze, the, the ceramic glaze. Here we see an angel. And then it's all set within her, um, again, still handmade tiles. Uh, we see the little hashtag there, hashtag live at five with Kevin. And the grandchildren used to sit here in the courtroom uh, and they would sit on the ledge, which I'm sure in the winter was extra cozy since the radiator is coming through those tiles. And then they could wait on their parents to swing through the court to pick them up. And then on the walls of this room, Henry Booth would uh, display many of his watercolors. And then he had a collection of objects there. Also in this room is a Puabic pottery fireplace, uh, one of a series in the house. And this fireplace originally had metal tools by David Booth, the, one of the sons who just recently passed away. Um, this tile work again shows the influence of Byzantine art and Byzantine tile work uh, brought forward into the 20th century with the uh, sort of scroll work the, or the, the knotted work within the different geometries set within it. And I can just imagine how lovely it would be to have a sort of fire glowing inside and then the flickering of the room reflected in this really deep glaze. And I'm sure that the camera Facebook isn't doing it no favors, um, but in person, just the richness of, of the glaze and how you can see the clay body through the glaze and this shimmering sort of exists in this liminal space between the glassy finish, the clay body behind it, and then these shimmers just sort of come out between the two. A sunburst there at the center. Now, on Sunday, I'll talk a bit more about George Booth and Mary Stratton. They were collaborators at projects at Cranbrook, like the Rainbow Fountain, uh, and some work at Cranbrook House. 
their, I think, masterpiece of collaboration is the baptistry at Christ Church Cranbrook, after which the, the uh, George Booth and Mary Stratton, who had worked together to form the Society of Arts and Crafts, worked together on these installations for Cranbrook, uh, had a falling out, very dramatic, uh, and they would not patch up their re uh, relationship for an, another few years. Um, uh, or the falling out was between the Rainbow Fountain and Christchurch Cranbrook, and so they patched up their relationship to build Christchurch Cranbrook and then to do all the work at Kingswood. And so, again, another reason to sign up for Sunday's tour of Mary's own house, where I'll tell some of the other Cranbrook stories. The relationship between Henry, Carolyn, and Mary was, I think, um, not sort of... Uh, clouded by the drama of, of George and Mary's own um, intersection of Episcopalian thriftiness and artisanal uh, intellect. Um, instead, Henry and Carolyn, they loved having artists in the house um, who were also friends. So like the Spiegel brothers, and here we see a, a wood carving by Willem Spiegel, who Henry met in 1922 on a trip through Europe with his University of Michigan classmate, uh, Bob Swanson, and the Spiegels, the Swansons, and the Booths became fast uh, transatlantic friends, and so uh, pieces like this were carved just for Thornley in Abergimerau. Now, we passed the Powabic radiator cover there, and again, we are coming live with the Center for Collections and Research from Thornley House, the home of Henry and Carolyn Booth. Uh, which is just off of Cranbrook Road, and we are focusing on the Powabic pottery. And we have arrived at our first floor-to-ceiling, wall-to-wall Powabic pottery bathroom. And this bathroom is yellow. We will see that they're all a little bit different. Uh, and with the light reflecting on it, we really see the beauty of the handmade glaze and the handmade shaping, the molding of the tile. It's There's these sort of lotus blossom motif that moves around. And, you know, with George Booth, so much of what I study in the archives, I can really get a sense of how he chose iconography and why he did things certain ways. And it's just a little surprising that I don't know more about Henry Booth's um, intention with these designs. The records just don't exist at Powabic Archives, our Cranbrook Archives, are the Smithsonian Archives of American Art, as to how they actually settled on color or motif. So this wonderful yellow and teal uh, bathroom, I love that the top row of tiles has the slight molding to it as it expands. And then around the doorway, you see that Henry, uh, who was of course the architect, called out in the wooden door molding, the same teal of the lotus blossom, and then the great round door cover, and then over here, your happy host. Next, we'll go from the guest bedroom into Henry's own bedroom. Now, Thornley has been used as a guest house since it was given to Cranbrook. Today, it is part of our COVID-19 planning, uh, and this is where we have been quarantining some students, though luckily none recently. This was Henry's own bathroom with this um, rich sort of taupe Powabic pottery tile, uh, and you can again see the variety of colors across the entire bathroom. And then in his own bathroom, which is really the simplest, there are none of the decorative tiles, though it does have the same arched door and then the same Powabic pottery floor. So we'll head on to the next Powabic installation, which is another fireplace. And so in Henry's own bedroom, he has this small fireplace that connects to the main living room chimney uh, stack. And this has more of those tiles that are similar. If you uh, have attended Christchurch Cranbrook, you know the Powabic pottery floor. These remind me of the floor of the, um, of the nave or the choir at Christchurch Cranbrook. And again, are inspired by Byzantine uh, art forms. So looking at the sort of post 
Roman Empire geometric designs of Southern Europe. Next, we pass through the uh, little vestibule, uh, and there's a few things that show me this is a student of Aelial Saarinen, because Henry Booth studied architecture at University of Michigan under Aelial Saarinen, and so things like having curtains dividing this little room, and even the calling out of the molding with this deep, deep um, sort of rose color, and then the light blue ceiling are things that the Sarnins did in their own house. Uh, it's things they did at Tower Knoll on Lone Pine Road. And so I think it's the student really reflecting the master with some of the decorating decisions. There's the little family chapel, the oratory between uh, Mr. and Mrs. Booth's bedroom. And then Carolyn's bedroom with a beautiful uh, bay window overlooking her garden and yard. But we are most interested in her, not her dressing room, but in Carolyn's bathroom, which is one of the great bathrooms at Cranbrook. If I was quarantined from the dormitories, or, uh, this is where I would want to be. Uh, so you have, again, floor to ceiling, uh, two different shades of of sort of teal, a teal or turquoise on the floor, and then a more muted teal along the walls. We have yet another variety of radiator covers, pierced tiles here. One question that I have is, are the soap dishes poavic? I do not think that they are. I, they look more commercially manufactured and the color isn't an exact match. Um, but I'll be intrigued to, to hear any opinions you might have. Um, on Sunday, we'll see the only bathroom sinks that Powabic ever made were made for her own house. And then as we turn all the way around, I love the uh, ceiling of the shower, which is this sort of uh, dome, your own little temple in the morning. And there is a separate shower and bath. So showers would have been quite new at this point. If you've taken a tour or a live at five over at the Smith house with me, you know that Frank Lloyd Wright never thought showers were particularly civilized. And so the Smiths did not have showers. Um, in their Frank Lloyd Wright house, they only had baths. And there was also a gendered aspect and it was thought to be unhealthy for ladies to shower. And so uh, the a modern house like this would have a more modern contraption, the shower, but then also pair it with the more traditional bath. And then it, behind the bath is the great Powabic backsplash. And if you are familiar with the Rainbow Fountain to the north of the Japanese Garden, close to the Kingswood School dormitories, I think you can see a similarity in Mary Stratton's architectural installation for the Rainbow Fountain and then for the bathroom here. And as we get closer, so none of these tiles have that chemical um, iridescence, the kerosene iridescence until you get close to them. So it doesn't really look metallic, but then as I move the camera closer, do you see how you're seeing the kerosene glaze as we move over those dark, dark uh, turquoise, blue, greenish tiles, and you see that rainbow effect as I move along them. It is really stunning. and then the, the archway up above. So uh, we'll move through like any grand home. It links the bedrooms of the children, the nurse and the mother together, uh, separate from the main hall of the house. So there's young Master Stephen, and then uh, the nursery bathroom here, uh, which I really just, I love this wall with this thin turquoise line running through it uh, between the two. Um, the question was, do these need repair now and then? If so, is that difficult? 
Um, the tiles don't need repair. Um, the bathrooms have needed repair, and so within uh, the cultural properties collection, I do have a few boxes um, of extra tiles. So as the plumbing has changed, um, a number of the fixtures have need are, are larger, and so we'll lose tiles that way. But it's kind of a benefit because it then means that I have a small library of the extra Powabic pottery tiles. To my knowledge, and I've only been here four years, um, to my knowledge, none of these have ever had to be uh, overhauled to the extent of, you know, removing the floor and placing it back down. Uh, I love this little bathroom. Uh, it looks a little bit wider on screen than it is in person. It has this sort of greenish tone to it, and it also has the decorative figures pressed in, which you actually notice even more through the camera's lens. Uh, and so there you have perhaps a, a wood grouse uh, singing along. And then over here, uh, I don't know, is that a crow? We are at Cranbrook, so we can also just say all of these are cranes. De facto, any bird I see, it's a crane. Uh, the crosses and the X's, the circles, it really is a sort of fabulous variety of tiles. And then up at the top, you have these two flowers that repeat around with the inset uh, teal and yellow glaze. And if you notice, the two flowers are divided by this line that runs up, and it just visually, to me, links back to this sort of motif of the bathroom tile. And again, I don't know if this is the architect or if it is uh, the potter, if it's Henry Booth or Mary Stratton. Okay, uh, as we move through the house, um, you might be thinking to yourself, this is a lot of Puabic pottery, and you would be right. Uh, you know, my predecessor, Stephanie K. duglatz octon who was the previous Collections Fellow, she actually wrote a book on Puabic at Cranbrook, and that is for sale in our gift shop if you're looking for holiday gifts. Um, uh, but in that writing process, she did research extensively the date books and the order forms, and so I'm not sure in the scale of Powabic where this commission comes in. Uh, you know, I'm sure it was much, much smaller than the Shrine of, the Immacu of Immaculate Conception. It was smaller than the Detroit Institute of Arts or the Detroit Public Library, all of which were completed in this 1925 to 1930 date. But I think for a residence, this is one of the larger Powabic commissions. It was $5,748, which I did the math for you. That is over $85,000 in 2020 money. So imagine for just four bathrooms, three fireplaces, window sills, and radiator covers, no fixtures, just the tiles, $85,000. It really is a um, uh, uh, investment in artistry and in bathrooms. So next we're going to head upstairs, which the house is huge. It's 20,840 uh, square feet. Uh, it features this wonderful ice water uh, fixture here on the second floor so that the bedrooms can get water. And this does have that iridescent glaze with the kerosene vapor interacting with the lead base uh, to create the shiny golden um, effect. Now, as we head up to the third floor, which uh, has been converted into an apartment that is currently unoccupied. Um, this is also where uh, Mr. Booth liked to keep all of his awards, and I forget the exact name of it, but did he call it the Pride Walk? Uh, this is where all of his honorary degrees and civic commendations were. This is now used for storage for many of Cranbrook's cultural properties, but it also is the entrance into the best bathroom at Cranbrook, maybe even better than Sarn, into the fantasy bathroom. Um, I just love this color. I love the richness of the glaze. I love that instead of using the figural, using the figural design, uh, it's designed by uh, using some squares that are the full two and a half inches, and then some that are one inch tiles, and so they uh, uh, become these smaller 
sort of cross designs, but done instead of by pressing, by stamping the tile, done by using different shaped tiles. Um, I adore the color combination of this rich sort of Little Mermaid blue uh, within a deep, uh, rich, saturated green on the ceiling and the green window molding, and especially here at dusk with the sort of purplish sky. It's just such a harmonious color scheme. And these are the kind of details that I think uh, when Mary Stratton praised Henry and Carolyn for understanding the plasticity of the form, uh, things like, you know, just these details where that's not a cut tile, that is actually a custom tile. So it's all rounded on all sides. And then the custom molding tile here. And as I get closer, you see all of the different colors within the glaze. And I don't know ceramics well enough to know how that they how she actually got this sort of washed glaze where it looks like water running down, um, almost like marbled paper for a book. I don't know if it's two different glazes that she floats over the surface, um, but it's really amazing and you can see how reflective it is. And then just when you thought this room couldn't get any better, we get to the shower, which has the fish scale tiles in it. And this is a great uh, moment for me to lead into the uh, tour on Sunday, because at the Stratton House, the master bath is actually done entirely in the same tile. And so we'll see how Mary Stratton's own bathtub and shower were done in identical tile to this one the sort of fish scale design in this really beautiful blue. I almost wish that we were here uh, before sunset because when the sun is streaming into this room, it faces due south, so it gets direct sunlight. Uh, these tiles just absolutely shimmer with life. And then it has this uh, fun little detail in order to bring light into that second stair hall. Uh, the windows shoot across, and so this uh, window, which you'll see is the pebbled glass here and then transparent glass here, uh, looks down into the stair hall. So I know that this is one of our most popular Instagram posts we've ever posted, is the photograph of this bathroom taken by uh, Cranbrook School alum Colton Grob. It really is an enchanting room. So. Thank you, Carolyn, for reminding me that this was called the Ego Walk. And of course, we do have all of his certificates um, just for safekeeping and for archival purposes. They've been removed from the e Ego Walk. And we've come to our last Powabic bathroom. Uh, and so this bathroom is uh, much more simple, much less knock your socks off, but equally, I think, charming, particularly its situation within the home. We're in the gable end directly over Carolyn's bedroom. So that beautiful bay window is one floor beneath us. And it has this charming uh, symmetrical design with the little window where you could shoot your sort of quiver of arrows out at the, the pool. Um, and then it has this rhythm of tiles where you have the four circles to one circle uh, moving around the room in a sort of asymmetrical pattern. So, uh, this was Aunt Cynthia's room, it looks like, in the comments. I, I'm going to head back downstairs uh, to just, again, we did miss one fireplace, so I want to uh, head back there and give you, again, a sense of the house. Here you can see how that bathroom lets light into the stairway during the day. And I have heard that that window was not original, but added because the stairway was so dark. Um, the house has a lot of details that to me just say, you know, this is a young architect getting all of these wonderful ideas that he's picked up on his travels uh, out in one building. It has just a real sort of sense of 
energy of this is someone who has traveled to Europe, who has seen things he likes, who watched his parents build their own Cranbrook house, uh, and now his, here is his chance. And he does all of the sort of ideas um, on and makes a really quirky little house. So this fireplace is quite different, and I will uh, allow myself to be corrected if it is not Powabic. Um, by counting the fireplaces that were purchased, to this one has to be Powabic, but I could be missing one. So um, it is certainly different. It is matte finished. Um, there is a glaze on it, so it's smooth to the touch. It's not just bisque fired or raw clay, uh, but it looks totally different from what else we've seen. But Mrs. Stratton, she did make the roofing tiles of her own house, and she made other pieces that you might not think were coming out of a handmade pottery that was also making lamps and vases. And so I think it is with certainly within the realm of possibilities that this guest room fireplace is, in fact, poabic. So thanks so much for joining me for another Live at Five. Uh, I'm Kevin Atkinson, the curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And before you go, I just want to uh, invite you again to Sunday's uh, Cranbrook Neighbors Tour. This is a new initiative that I'm really excited to launch in coming up with ways to uh, bring Cranbrook stories to you in a virtual and new way, uh, stories that we couldn't do if we were all together in person uh, because of size limits. I thought, what if there was a way to go out and see not only the Cranbrook House Museums, uh, but houses that are related to Cranbrook stories. And so on Sunday, uh, we will have our first Cranbrook Neighbors Tour. It is going to Mary Chase Perry Stratton's own house. Uh, so the founder of Puabic Pottery, she partnered with her friend, William Buck Stratton, who was an important Detroit architect. He did the Women's Club on Campus Martius. He did um, uh, the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts building on Watson Street that burned down a, a decade ago. Um, he did a number of houses in Gross Point. He then fell in love with his client, Mary Stratton. They were married, and it turned in from a house he built for the potter to live in with her mother to a house that they lived in as a family. Uh, they did moved the house from Detroit to Gross Point Farms. And so when they moved it, they expanded it. They incorporated architectural elements from their travels in Spain. So they bought an entire porch and added it into the house. They bought uh, Spanish um, moldings and Spanish uh, sort of steel cut patterns, and they've turned those into architectural features. Uh, and then, of course, she made all of the fixtures in the house. So the only Powabic pottery bathroom sinks, the only Powabic pottery roof, uh, the only Powabic pottery uh, one after the other. It was a, a place like Alvar Alto's experimental house in Finland. It was her own experimental house where she worked out ideas and created things at her pottery on Jefferson Avenue for use in her house in um, Gross Point Farm. Today, uh, it is the residents of Philip Morrissey and Joe Nicarada, uh, who are the owners of Fleur Detroit, and they have transformed the house. Uh, it was renovated by Alexander Gerard in the 1950s. They have kept Gerard's changes and added their own collection of art. And so we're going to be focused on their collection of Cranbrook artists. They are huge supporters of Cranbrook, of the Center for Collections and Research, doing our entire historic restoration of the landscape at the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House, but they are also um, uh, uh, deeply invested in the students. And so I think it's a wonderful house in order to understand how contemporary art from Cranbrook students can be incorporated into historic interiors. You really don't want to miss it. It's one of my favorite houses in America. It's a totally unique experience, and we are only offering this live. So uh, it will not be recorded, and it will not be available for viewing after Sunday at 3. So make sure you head to center.cranbrook.edu and get your tickets to tour Mary Chase Perry Stratton's own house in Gross Point Farm. If you enjoyed these bathrooms, 
I know that you're going to enjoy the tour of her very unique house. I want to thank Philip and Joe for letting us into the house on Sunday. I want to thank all of the Henry and Carolyn Booth children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren who are watching. And thank you for donating this house to Cranbrook uh, and continuing the Booth family legacy of uh, beauty and art and utility uh, in service of education, science, and art and for the public good. Um, Again, I'm Kevin Atkinson, and I'm coming to you live from Thornley on the uh, edge of Cranbrook's campus. I'm, thank you so much for joining, and I'm not seeing any questions that I didn't answer. If I didn't get to it in the, vi in the talk, I'll type out an answer there. And again, if you want to learn more about the house itself and Henry Carolyn, their artistic endeavors, their charity and uh, philanthropy, go back and look at my tour from earlier this summer of the Thornley House. And that's on the Center for Collections and Research Facebook page on the videos tab. Thanks so much for watching. Be safe, everyone. Uh, and I will see you on Sunday for the Stratton House tour or back here on the next Facebook Live at 5 next Wednesday.